and how might Christians in particular approach this uneasy oscillation of music and language. Let me have a go at risking three assertions. To get our bearings, we can start with the proverbial elephant in the room, or should I say in the church, something there, but often unacknowledged. According to the Christian tradition, God has pulled human language into the center of his purposes. This is extraordinarily obvious, but often not acknowledged, or the sheer significance and import of it not acknowledged. This is not just a Protestant hang-up, nor is it just an impulse created by modernity. Language matters to Christians not because they've decided it matters, but because God has. When I speak at gatherings on faith and the arts, I often find a strange tendency to denigrate language, per se, as if human speech about God, for instance, were our invention, as if it were basically an impediment, an obstacle to speaking about God, or to, to, to uh, relating to God, I should say. And then the arts are then all too easily pulled in to give us an excuse to soar into a no-words zone, where God, of course, is thought to reside. The Christian faith makes a daring declaration, and it is that God has, so to speak, got his hands on human language, appropriated human words for his purposes. In order to reconcile us to himself, he has used human language as intrinsically, integrally part of that process. And that finds its pointed climax in Jesus himself, a human being who uses words. The word becomes flesh. The word becomes word user. Here, God incarnate speaks. And through these words, disciples are gathered. Through Jesus, his followers learn a fresh way of talking, a fresh speech. Old words take on new meanings. Familiar words take on unfamiliar tones. This is the new language of the kingdom of God. God talk. In time, a larger group learns the language, the church. And this godly chatter, this irrepressible speaking, spreads and spreads and spreads. And eventually it is written down as scripture. In Calvin's great phrase, consigned to public record. You can tell he was a lawyer, can't you? And as scripture is read and preached, the church can hear again the God who first speaks in Jesus Christ. This means some language becomes normative for the church. There will be language we return to and again and again as our benchmark, supremely the language of Scripture with the language of Jesus at its center. And we return to these words not simply to repeat them, but to learn a new language through them, a new language that God will use to shape us, form us, reform us as the church in this age and in every age. So there never comes a time when language can be ignored, and supremely this language, for the Christian. But before we turn into fanatical Protestants, <laughs> we need to drop a heavy qualifier in here. And here the Romantics have something to teach us. Language, the first of all, is, sorry, language is always caught up with realities bigger than itself, in at least two senses. First of all, language, just to say the obvious, always implies a context. Language, after all, is used by people and the total context is part of the meaning. When we think of the meaning of words, we should not think of words alone, but words as used by people in specific contexts. This is one of the big thrusts of the language philosophy of Wittgenstein, who again uh, we mentioned. Here we need to have done once and for all with simple picture theories or representative theories of language as if they explained all language use. Yes, indeed, with a child you may hold up a metal object and say, spoon. And you might be saying, this is a spoon. But you might be saying, use a spoon and not a fork. Or use a spoon and not your fingers. That's an imperative. It's not a statement of fact. It's an imperative. How do you know which of that would mean? Because of context. Because of a variety of contextual factors. So that's just a kind of very obvious thing. Herder saw this. Many of the language theorists in the 19th century saw this. Strange how this is often forgotten today. And Wittgenstein had to come along and bless his heart, say the obvious. I mean, a lot of Wittgenstein is extraordinarily obvious. Um, but as, uh, as the bishop was saying last night, sometimes, sometimes we need the obvious said to us. Second sense, though, 
and here the Romantics really do have something to say, the realities of which language speak always exceed the grasp of language. Now, the Romantics sense this, even if they might not have um, played it in helpful directions and exaggerated, and okay, there was philosophical muddle and all the rest of it, but they sense this. However much we try to describe something, words will always fail us somewhere along the line. The reality is always more than the words can hold. I say to my wife, you're beautiful. The statement is hopelessly inadequate. The words are true, yes, and they're necessary. Please note, as any marriage counselor will remind us, <laughs> these words or something like them or the equivalent are needed for a healthy marriage. Yet the language is weak, feeble. What could I say about your beauty, my darling, that could ever be adequate? No, 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 no. The reality outstrips anything that could be captured by speech. So it is with God and our relation to God. God talk may be necessary, but it is always inadequate. And often modernity has been slow to recognize this with disastrous effects.